So again, morning, everyone. We are going to be completing the atomic physics topic today. What we've done so far has been the evolution of the atomic model, right? Yeah, it will be the evolution of the atomic model. Um, we looked at isotopes, radioactive emissions, radioactive decay, half-life, and now we're going to go on to nuclear energy. Now, there are a couple of topics that are reading topics, so I will guide you or give you the notes on what topics you should be reading up just to get a little bit of knowledge on. All right, so moving on to a nuclear energy, because any time people hear about atomic physics, the first thing they think about is one, nuclear energy, and two, radioactivity. That's all most people think about, and that's not a wrong assumption to me. All right, so let's just move on. So nuclear energy. Einstein predicted, so we're coming up to Einstein, so we're right now in the 1920s, 1930s of physics. Einstein predicted that if the energy of a body changes by an amount E, the mass will decrease. He related this and this he related this in the very well known equation of E is equal to MC squared. Everybody has heard of this equation, has the best of all equations. This has the best PR, meaning the most public public publication. All right, so E is equal to MC squared, where E is your energy in joules. Energy is always, always, always measured in joules. We have our mass in kilograms, always in kilograms. And we have C, which is the speed of light. Anybody could recall what is the speed of light? Three by 10 to the power of eight. Three by 10 to the eight meters per second, or 300 million meters in a second. So what happens, what he realized or what they had proposed at that time, obviously they didn't have the technology to go, you know, to look at how things move at the speed of light. Um, anytime something approaches the speed of light, regular physics breaks down, right? The physics that we have right now, the physics that we use generally is called Newtonian physics. Right, Newtonian physics is general physics we use. But once an object or a particle or a ray approaches the speed of light, Newtonian laws do not hold again. Right? Why? Because mass breaks down into energy. If you were to travel at the speed of light, all of your atoms will just turn into energy. Right? So it kind of sounds like you're just going to get beyond atomized if you try to travel at the speed of light. So once they came up with how to move at the speed of light or how things move at the speed of light, they end up entering the realm of quantum physics. So quantum physics is a brand new world of physics. It's one of the most exciting worlds of physics. It's kind of one of the most um, basic. We're right now in the basic forms of physics. Right? Because quantum physics can only exist at speed of light and beyond the speed of light or working at the speed of light and working in space and whatnot. Um, we are right now in the very, very beginning stages of quantum physics. So Newtonian physics doesn't work. We don't really touch on quantum physics too much at all. At this level, the only thing you know about is Einstein's equation, which is E is equal to mc squared. So what happens, this is what happens. When something travels at the speed of light or approaching the speed of light, mass turns into energy. And when mass turns into energy, let's think about if you have 100 kilograms of object and it's approaching traveling the speed of light, some of that mass is going to turn into energy. And if some of that mass is turned into energy, obviously our mass is going to decrease. And we call this decrease in mass the mass defect. There's also another term for mass defect we look at just now, because it's very interesting how mass works when it comes to atoms and how it comes to, when it comes to moving at the speed of light. It works differently. All right, Newtonian physics does not work, which is things like force is equal to ma 
and those things they don't work when we're dealing with small very small objects when we deal with the atom when we're dealing with question oh gonna see all right an enormous amount of energy so let's read this an enormous amount of energy is released when atoms are split or, or fused or split these energies are the basis for life for the life of the sun and without the sun we'll have no life on earth all right so we have to look at two things we have when two atoms are joined together we have fusion fusion means to join and when two atoms are split into two meaning we break them apart that's called fission so you have to learn what's the difference between the two the easiest way to learn here fusion comes from the word fuse and to fuse together fuse means to stick two things together so one is the opposite of next so fusion is where we take two atoms and combine them together and fission is when we take an atom and we split it apart into two different sections so two different things happen for fusion and fission all right fusion and fission are two events that happen with the atom and happens with the nucleus we can either bring two atoms together and join them or we can take an atom and split it into two parts and by doing this we're going to liberate a lot of energy why do we liberate energy in splitting something whenever we have to split an atom right being again you all remember we're talking about atomic physics and the entire story here lies within the nucleus itself all of the particles within the nucleus of an atom are under a high amount of stress and energy because remember we have a whole bunch of protons in here and a whole bunch of other particles that are moving at high speed and they're just bound together when we have to break this apart right what we end up doing we end up splitting some of that and then spilling it think about if you have a bag of rice a bag of rice that is very 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 densely packed and you were to split open that bag of rice wouldn't you end up getting some of the rice spilling out and going into other places yeah the same kind of thing happens here all right when you split open an atom because everything there is bound by a lot of energy together when you split it o split it open you release energy all right and that energy um goes into different places and areas so let's see how those energies work and what is the nature of these two types of atomic actions fission and fusion so we start with fusion first right nuclear fusion is the joining of two smaller atoms to form a larger one when this is done excess energy excess energy i'm missing a word there is released um excess energy neutrons are emitted at high speed so what happens anytime we have an atom and we bring them together and it's trying to get rid of excess energy remember we said the whole basis of the universe is that everything wants to occupy the lowest energy state possible so it does everything it can all the forms of energy we see and experience are because some system some body some not a body as a person next year all right as not body all right somebody is trying to get rid of excess energy and here when we take two atoms and bring them together and it wants to get rid of excess energy it's going to do that by emitting a neutron at a very high speed this high speed neutron has kinetic energy that can be harnessed or utilized the energy used and produced by the sun is a product of nuclear fusion other examples of nuclear fusion were seen in the hydrogen bomb i am not going to touch on the hydrogen bomb at all so if you all want to read about the physics of a hydrogen bomb go ahead all right an economic process that can be used to harness energy fusion has not yet been devised now there are big news on that topic big news meaning within the last two weeks big news so let's look and see what happens here our sun our star our local star which is a yellow dwarf 
So our, our star dwarf means small, right? Our star, our sun, which is, sun is the name of our star, by the way, all right? Is a yellow dwarf star. It's a small little one. Has anyone ever seen the comparison of stars? I will show you that. I'll send you that because I always show my astronomy club that every year, all right? What happens at the core of our star? Our star is like 70, 75, more than that, about 90% hydrogen. And what happens in the very core of the sun, if this is the sun and this is the, the shiny part, the very, very core of the sun, because it has very high temperature and extremely high pressures and gravity, we have the conditions necessary to join up two hydrogens. And when we join up two hydrogens, we're going to end up getting a helium. So this is how the sun generates its energy by forcing those two hydrogens to bond and become helium. The excess energy produces heat and produces a whole bunch of other types of electromagnetic um, waves. As in all, nearly all the forms of electromagnetic waves can come out of a star. Nearly, and then not all stars. So let's see what happens in our sun. Or in this case, let's take a look at two forms of hydrogen. We have two isotopes of hydrogen here. Isotopes. All right, we have deuterium and tritium. Anybody ever heard of tritium? No. Anybody here ever watch original Spider-Man? The Spider-Man from the 90s and the O's. You're not watching enough TV, you know? <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, if you recall back to... That's now... I'm looking for the image. Ah, here we are. More chat. Yep, they tried to make a small sun, right? If you all watch Spider-Man 2, now this is where I always say um, movies, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're really wrong, and sometimes they're inspired by science. You all remember Doc Ock? Saw so Sp Spider-Man 2 with... Dr. Octavius, right? And if you go back and look at that, Dr. Octavius had gotten tritium, right? He used tritium to try to make a small sun, right? Yes, he did end up succeeding. He had a big magnetic something here and a little sun behind him and whatnot. So what he had ended up doing, he used, he then knew, we know that they used tritium and deuterium to make um, nuclear fusion that powers the sun. We know that, we've known that for quite a while because they know the kind of energy, what happens, each one of these atoms give off a certain amount of energy when they bond and we're able to record that kind of energy coming out of the sun. It's amazing how we can determine what goes on the sun, amazing. All right, we have really bright people out there. So in here, even though this is science fiction, right? This is technically, technically possible, right? No, it's not going to become an actual ignited ball of plasma that looks like a star. It doesn't do that, right? You need a large mass for that to happen, but this technically can happen when you take deuterium and tritium and combine them under high pressures and high temperatures, we can force them to squeeze together and become helium. And the only way that, as we said, that can happen is by looking at, is by using high temperatures. Hold on, let's look and see if I have it here. No. All right, by using high temperatures and high pressures. So what they do, they use two, um, what's the word? Two isotopes of, of um, hydrogen, and you end up getting 
if you want as a confirmed image all right and they end up getting what is it sorry sorry guys and they end up getting um helium being produced so let's look and see the mats involved here is just the same chemical reactions. You all know how to do chemical reactions here. Deuterium and tritium have the same amount of protons because that is what um, isotopes are. They have the same amount of protons but different amounts of neutrons. So if you look here, um, deuterium has one neutron and tritium has two neutrons. So when you add up these together, one plus one, let's zoom in so you can get a better right thing. When we add them up, one plus one, one plus one will give us two, right? Um, we know that helium is four, two, which is two protons, two neutrons. So the four and the, the two and the three will give us five, but to end up making helium, two of those, four of those will end up going towards the helium and the excess neutron because we end up with here with five the excess neutron will end up being produced as excess energy and this excess energy travels at a very high speed it takes the energy out of the atom and it carries it outwards so this is basically what happens at the core of our sun the very core of our sun we take deuterium we take tritium they are under extremely high temperatures, temperatures like 20, 30 million degrees Celsius, right? Very high pressures and gravities. And because it's very, very high pressure, it can actually squeeze the two atoms together and cause them to overcome their um, atomic and nuclear energies that bond them together and squeeze them together, All right? And any excess neutrons fly out as excess energy and heat. Just a little, a little thing. So if this is the core of the sun and this is the photosphere of our sun, the part that we see, right? The energy generated at the core of the sun takes about, it takes many thousands of years for that energy to move from the middle of the sun to the out, outer ends of the sun. It takes quite a long time for that energy to travel. Why? Because we have a whole bunch of other things going on in the sun that traps energy. All right, the physics of the sun is amazing, absolutely amazing and mind-boggling, which is basically all stars. Eh? But, so this is what happens for fusion. Fusion is when we take two atoms, we add them together, and we get a larger atom. That's basically what nuclear fusion is. And because we've joined them together, any excess neutrons right, is emitted as a high-speed energy carrier. So here, this is not radiation. This is not nuclear physics here. This is not radioactivity that's happening here, all right? Because when they say the sun emits other types of radiation, other types of particles, this is one of the particles that it will emit. It will emit a high-speed neutron. Neutrons are not radioactive. We already went through our three types of radioactive radiation or um, decay, which are alpha, beta, and gamma. The sun emits far more than just radioactive particles. It doesn't even, actually doesn't emit any radioactive particles. It emits a whole bunch of other streams of energy that can reach to the earth and disrupt the earth. All right, so there are far greater and worse things out there than nuclear radiation. Far worse and far more energetic. If you want to read up on it, you all can go and read up. Don't get me started. We'll be there whole day. So then we have nuclear fusion and fission. So let's just look at fission. Fission, zooming in. Sorry, that was too much. All right, when a large atom or nucleus, remember here we use the word atom and nucleus interchangeably because our whole story lies in the nucleus. So when a large atom or nucleus is breaking up, broken up, it releases energy. Why? Because there's a lot of energy holding it together and the instant we break it up it's going to release some of that energy this can happen naturally or by artificial means 
If a nucleus is hit with a high-speed neutron, it will destabilize and may, note the word, may split into two. Sometimes an atom is so energetic, if we hit it with a high-speed neutron, it'll just say, hey, look, a neutron. It'll hold on to that neutron and do nothing and get even worse. But sometimes if you get the right energy or the right type of atom and you hit it with that neutron, you will cause it to destabilize, you know, like you hit in a whole pile of blocks or cards and you hit it with that block, it's going to cause it to split into probably two. It doesn't always happen because you need the right amount of energy and the right um, circumstance for it to happen. So let's take a look at what happens here for nuclear fission and fusion. So for fusion is where we took the deuterium and we combined it with the tritium to give us helium and, sorry, an excess neutron. Fission is where we take um, a high-speed ne neutron. We usually use neutrons because neutrons, again, guys, have no charge. They have a very large mass, so we can use it to upset and to split and to join and to play with things. So this is how that neutron is extremely useful and extremely powerful because of its mass you see because it's the heaviest thing in the atom neutrons are used to cause they actually cause good and bad things they can disrupt your energy levels and they can calm it down so here we have bad boy big boy i call it big boy uranium you'll see why i call it big boy uranium uranium 235 this is what we use in the atom bombs all right so we have neutron hits our uranium-235. What happens? It now becomes uranium-236 because it's absorbed an extra new, um, neutron. At 236, our uranium is now completely unstable, right? As in, we've, take, we've added that extra neutron and we've destabilized the entire story. So what's going to happen? It's going to break apart. So you're going to hit it. And it's going to have too much energy and it's going to explode into two parts. It really does explode into two parts. And it becomes barium-144, krypton-89. And you get a whole bunch of excess neutrons. And guess what? These excess neutrons will go and hit more uranium, causing a chain reaction. So we're going to look at what chain reactions are now. You don't get chain reactions in fusion because fusion here... We take two particles, join them together. We get something nice and stable, right? So we get a stable helium and we end up with more neutrons carrying out excess energy. But when we have fusion, fusion produces what we call a chain reaction. As we make more and more particles, that will cause more and more of the same thing happening. So let's scroll down a wee little bit and see how this chain reaction works. All right, so chain reaction. So we just looked at here. When you take uranium-235, so 23592, we hit it with your neutron. It's going to split up and give us two particles. All right, if we add up our numbers, you're going to see 56 plus 36. 56 plus 36 is going to give you 92. And then when you add up these two numbers, it's going to give you 143 plus 90. You have to learn how to add fast. Two. All right. And we end up. And we end up with 233. Remember, 233 plus the one is going to give you your extra three. So all the numbers here balance out each other. So we end up getting when we hit just one uranium atom, one uranium atom with a neutron. It splits into two particles, so you get barium and you get krypton, and then we end up with three excess um, neutrons. Now, these three excess neutrons go on to hit more uranium, and each uranium is going to produce three excess neutrons. The diagram is actually further down, right? It's right here. All right, and cause what we um, is going to start what we call a chain reaction. So let's continue reading and see what we have. The neutrons produced during the split go on to interact with more uranium 235s, thus forming a chain reaction. Now, 
for uranium, we will use uranium, particularly on Earth, because uranium is found in a lot of our rocks. Right? Lots of countries mine uranium. The closest uranium mine that I know about is actually in Guyana. Right in Guyana, it's further further down. I think I um I was close to one of the areas they were prospecting for uranium. Remember, I said the other day. We can read the older rocks in Trinidad, like in the Northern Range, because the Northern Range dates back to about 60 million years ago. If you ever wanted to know what's the age of the rocks on in Trinidad, right? The Northern Range dates back to the dinosaurs, which is pretty cool, right? The Central Range area is probably about 2 million years old, and everybody else is less than a million years old by a lot. Right, some areas are just a few hundred thousand years old. Right, so Northern Range has the older rocks, and those older rocks all do have some degree of uranium in them. Right, not plenty, but has some degree of uranium in them. So there, it's easy to find rocks that have lots of uranium. So it's easy to mine and find. Um, so we have two types of nuclear fusion that occurs that we have learned to use and do. There is uncontrolled nuclear fusion. Uncontrolled nuclear fusion is just where neutrons go on to hit more and more and more and more uranium atoms, and they release so much energy, it just explodes into this big, huge, terrifying monster explosion. All right, then we have uncontrolled, then we have controlled nuclear fusion. Controlled nuclear fusion, this is where we know how many neutrons to use. We know how much energy we're going to get. So that means we use a certain amount of neutrons hitting a certain amount of uranium so we can produce um, an energy that we can funnel and utilize. We can't use the energy in an explosion because that just goes all over the place. But if we take small amounts, we're able to use it to generate steam, right? And to heat water to generate steam and then turn turbines. So that's to give you an example, this is to see why nuclear fusion, they are still running to nuclear fusion for power because it's generally, generally a clean energy source, right? The only problem with nuclear energy is that it makes um, radioactive rods that need to be disposed of carefully. And there is always the possibility of meltdown. Usually meltdown comes from human error, and then you have the very, very, very rare case of a tsunami. All right, so here, one kilogram. You all, one kilogram. You all know how heavy one kilogram is. One kilogram of uranium produces the same amount of energy as 10 million kilograms of coal. I don't even know what 10 million kilograms looks like. All right, so this is to tell you why there was such a big push to use nuclear energy because it's a small amount of uranium. So that means I don't need a lot in uranium. It'll probably take a, a nuclear power plant runs well for about 40 years. All right, 20 to 40 years runs really well. And look at how much energy it takes the place of. And when we use nuclear fusion to get energy, the only thing that that plant produces is steam. So ideally, if you didn't have the waste rods so we'll look into waste rods i'll send a document on that if it wasn't for the waste rods all right nuclear fusion nuclear energy would be very very clean energy and the chance of meltdown of all the nuclear power plants on the planet we've had three meltdowns three versus how much energy in carbon dioxide right and sulfur dioxide right to the point where we have acid rain all across europe and all of this comes from burning coal so let's look at how our fusion works so we have here this is what happens in our power plants nuclear power plants across the planet right we take a neutron we hit a uranium 235 with it that uranium now becomes 236 and it's completely destabilized and it's going to explode all right, and become barium and krypton. And what it does, it releases 200 mega electron volts of energy. Where's my calculator? I will tell you how much energy that is. Malika has joined back. All right, 200 mega electron volts. Somebody, 
multiply this out 200 by 1 by 10 to the 6 multiplied by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 18. Let's multiply it out quick and we'll see what we'll get. All right, that's how much energy is contained in one, we all, one atom. If anybody can multiply this, this is actually going to be 2 by 10 to the 8 by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 18, which is 3.2 by 10 to the minus 10 joules. Okay, all right, so one atom, your one single atom produces 3.2 by 10 to the minus 10 joules of energy. And you know atoms or blocks of materials have billions and trillions of atoms, trillions of atoms. So when you have to multiply that out, you're gonna get a lot of energy just from one single atom. You get a lot of energy being produced. And then we have what we call a chain reaction. So what happens? Every single neutron goes on to hit another uranium. And then it's going to, each uranium is going to emit 200 mega electron volts of energy or basically three by 10 to the minus 10 joules of energy. And that's trillions of atoms producing that, uh, that energy. So it's a lot of energy it produces for a very, very small amount. All right, just to give even more ideas and whatnot, fusion, nuclear fusion does produce a lot of energy, it produces far more energy than fission. But to make fusion happen, we need to take a lot of high temperatures and a lot of pressure. The amount of energy it takes to generate that high pressure makes it economically not viable to create fusion to power our plants and stuff on the planet. Now they are working on it. I think China most recently, do I have it here? No. China as in China in the last two weeks ramped up or they powered up their fusion reactors. And I think they generated electricity for like a week, um, not a week, like a couple of seconds. That doesn't sound like much, but imagine something is running at 30 million degrees Celsius. What on this planet could hold 30 million degrees Celsius. No metal can survive that temperature. Metals usually melt at 5,000 and less. All right, so you need to generate temperatures that are really high and pressures that are really, really high to enable fusion to happen. And they did do it in the last two weeks. They actually did get um, the China, Chinese reactors did generate some fusion. I'll look for the report and send it to you. It's really, really exciting that we've reached this, these parts. Fission we've been doing for quite for decades now. All we have to do, take a neutron, slam it into a uranium-235. That uranium-235 is going to get unstable and it's going to split apart into two particles. Here it's, we have a next type of particle happening. Here it's producing um, rubidium and cesium. Those are actually are the two types that happens. It's not always the same type, right? Uranium doesn't always split in, into barium and krypton. What happens? It depends on the neutron that we hit the uranium with. If we hit it with a very high-speed uranium, um, high-speed neutron, we get different things happening. So there's a real interesting bout of physics here. Right? Different neutrons or different speed neutrons produce different things. All right, and if you look here. Fusion produces far more energy, right? 3.4 by 10 to 11 kilojoules per kilogram. So every kilogram of matter produces this amount of energy, right? If you have to write it down, it'll be 3.4 by 10 to the 15 joules of energy for every kilogram. That's a lot of energy, right? And for fusion, it's going to end up producing... Um, 8.8 .8 by 10 to the 13 joules per kilogram of matter. So it's a lot of energy these things produce. Just one, you know, each kilogram produces a lot of energy. So right now they're still investigating or trying to find an economical way. They are trying, you all, they are trying, they're trying. Many research companies across the, the um, planet are trying to find an economical way to create fusion 
to replace our electricity on this planet because oil won't last forever, right? Gas won't last forever. Wave action can only be used in a few parts of the planet. Not everyone could use wind power. Yes, we can use solar panels, but the problem with solar panels, it doesn't power big plants. We need something that produces a lot of your energy, right? Fission is fine. This is what we use in nuclear power plants. This is still what is used in nuclear weapons, but nobody has used a nuclear weapon since it's actually only once that they use nuclear. I think the last set of nuclear weapons that were used, only nuclear weapons we used on people were in Japan, right? We, they still do test nuclear weapons ever so often. North Korea and their special little boy. <laughs> right? Okay, yeah, I shouldn't call him that. All right? Nuclear, um, Japan still, not Japan, North Korea still tests nuclear weapons. And we are able to determine when a country tests a nuclear weapon because it generates an earthquake that we can measure. All right? So imagine that. We can, anytime somebody uses a nuclear weapon or tests a nuclear weapon, they can't hide it because it creates waves that move through the planet and there's a special type of wave. The wave acts differently than an earthquake wave. And we are able to tell when somebody is testing from across the planet. I'm sure the UV seismic center here can pick up those waves too. All right. And we are able to tell when they test the nuclear weapons. Pretty cool that we can do that too. No, if somebody put a nuclear weapon in the next side of the planet, it's not going to do us anything. All right. They have to be really, 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 really big weapons that can do that. So um, that is it for here. Now, there are a couple of questions that I have to teach you all how to do. So from here, we're going to move on to questions. So let's see. Question one, question two, question three. All right. All of these we would have done already. We am, I'm probably going to put out a tutorial on how to do things dealing with radioactive, no, with nuclear energy. There are quite a few nuclear energy questions in the handout that you all can learn to read, learn to do. And once you all, if you all get these questions, it's such giveaway marks. Right? It's just multiplying and adding. That's all it is. We just have to learn to multiply and add, which you all should know how to do. I do trust every one of you all knows how to multiply and add. All right. And we will, so I'll give out a little tutorial on how to do these questions or we can spend a day doing these out. So that is it for nuclear energy and atomic physics. We do have a couple reading topics to do. And those reading topics are, right, nuclear energy and radioactivity. Now I could type faster, right, in medicine. We do use radio, nuclear energy and radioactivity in medicine for both good and bad. We use it in industry. And you all have to know what are the safety protocols when it comes to dealing with radioactive and nuclear devices, right? I personally don't really, I need to get a, um, a safety glove when I'm using our radioactive sources. Yes, we do have radioactive sources in school. All right, let's stop this share screen. Right, but the sources that we have are really, really, really small. What they did, they would grind up the radioactive material, make a solution. They will take a disc. I have a disc, a disc about this big. Right, it's about this big. And they will put a drop of the solution in the middle, and that's our radioactive source. And we're able to measure it. We're able to see what it does. And I still, I've never physically touched any of them. I use a long forceps, right? And I stand about an arm's length away from them because they don't record any radiation around them. They only record radiation above them, all right? So all the radiation only occurs above. I've tested and seen. So when you're dealing with radioactive sources, you have to be a certain distance away. You have to use proper shielding. You cannot touch them. You're not supposed to touch them, even though we do touch some radioactive materials around us. You all want to know what's the most radioactive common thing you all use every single day or always in your life. It's a fruit. It's a yellow fruit. Anybody want to guess?
bananas. Bananas have um, a potassium isotope in it, and sometimes that potassium isotope is radioactive. All right, so you always have some degree of radioactive material in you. All right, always, always have radioactive material in you. All right, we are exposed to a lot of radioactive sources around us. There is radiation that comes from the sky. It comes from space. We're exposed to a lot of radiation every single day of our lives. So I have a little chart. I'll post it up for you. Kind of mind-blowing. Right? I love the chart. So you all will take a look and see how things around us do have their radiation and how their radiation compares to each other. Remember, radiation is the amount of energy. Yeah, we could do a banana explosion. I, I, somehow I don't think if we eat a banana, cake and bread with banana pudding and then banana ice cream, you all somebody used to make a really good banana ice cream, you know. KFC used to make a really good banana ice cream, but they stopped selling it. Um, I don't think the banana oil I use for my nail polish. <laughs> right? The banana oil. Come on, focus. Really is radioactive. But there are a lot of things around us that have radiation in them. But we are built to handle a certain amount of radiation because it's always around us. Look, the same thing we went on, UV radiation. We need UV radiation from the sun to generate vitamin D to absorb calcium. But what's happening now, we have too much radiation. We have different types of radiation, UV radiation, that is affecting us negatively. All right? So I will post up that little chart for you all, you all to take a look at it and see. Um, so I think that's going to be it. Or oh, for those who are watching the recording, we do have, I'm going to go through your books today. I'm going in school today. Yeah, I will go today and check everyone's book. And if everyone books are complete, I don't have to call you back. But if anybody here needs to complete a lab, um, what day is you all coming with Miss Pontifer again? Tuesday and Thursday? Tuesday. Tuesday. All right. Tuesday, Tuesday, I'm in school, my form. Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday and Thursday. Okay, cool. All right. Um, I'll try to come in school Thursday also. But again, I have workshops with CXE. So I have to be at CXE, even though it's the same setup, you know, on my chair in front of my computer. But I have to be at CXE next week for a few days. But I am bringing in my form fours on Tuesday. So that means they have their first lab on Tuesday. So I will set aside those who are there who have to finish their work, right, in the A-level lab. You will only have your book to use. You will only have your work to look at. Nobody's being allowed to look at anyone else's book. You all will have to, have to, have to maintain social distancing and mask wearing. Anybody found sitting next to each other or sitting without your mask on, I will put you out of the room and tell you go your way all right you all i'm going to allow you all to come to school if you have to stay after hours tuesday i have lessons so i have to be finished by two all right thursday if you have to finish up anything because i as i said i have started marking out everything with you all i have going to mark out the scripts today and tomorrow and after that is just to go through the lab books and finish marking them out so i want to be finished with your marks by next week as in, I don't want to be touching your books at all to mark anything after next week. So those of you all, I will give you a list. I will put up a list of those who have to finish what? Right? Miss, excuse. Yes. Miss, can I be allowed to finish? I need to fix something in my PD, please. I Which just, last night when I was going through some notes, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm like... The PD that we did since last year, right? I think I forget what I did in the method and I made a PD. So I think I need Wait, to fix one of the PDs we did PD. online? It was like 10 minutes. What? No, 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 not online. And the one in school, the one of what year was what? The one before? That one. The one from last year, the one before COVID. Before a lab, that was the only lab, the PD that we did. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll write it down so you'll come and check it. But again, I am only it's going lighter. to be. Yes. All right. Um, mm -hmm. the only people I'm going to be letting upstairs are those who have to finish up anything. I will take out your book specifically. 
All right, I'm not just gonna say anybody could come upstairs. I'm gonna check everyone's book, make sure that the SBA labs are all completed, only the SBA labs, all right? And those who have to finish up anything, which is to dot your I's, cross your T's, I will tell you, I'm gonna, again, I'm going in school today. I will make a list and I'll post it up for you all. All right, so I have no other news to send up for the rest of the class. Let me stop the recording, all right? And, um,